I call that a, a holy smoke moment, right? Like, oh my goodness, man. Your probability of getting noticed in each particular channel is not really increasing over time. In the beginning, maybe it's one platform more linear, and now it's more omnipresence, right? <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of The Dan Lok Show. And today I have a special guest. Eugene Levin is the Chief Strategy and Corporate Development Officer at FCM Brush. If you've been marketing online, you probably have seen the brand or maybe you are a customer. Before joining SEM Rush five years ago, Eugene was a partner in the international VC firm Target Global. Eugene, welcome to The Dan Lok Show. Thank you, Dan. Great, great to be on your show. Uh, first question for you is, what do you think is your superpower? Oh, that's that's a good one. Unexpected. Um, I think my superpower is luck. So, mm. so that's uh, that's an uh, unusual one. Uh, if you if you think about like super superheroes, uh, Domino had yes. this kind of superpower. I was thinking about that yeah. X Men. Yes, but I I, th I think the way I think about luck is is not that. It's a sort of flip of a coin. Um, being lucky is more about understanding probabilities and not making right, wrong choices to begin with. Like, like for example, I don't know if you if you walk down the street and and somehow you get into the fight, then mistake was was not like you know do you lo you know throw a left punch or right punch. The mm -hmm. mistake was to be in the street in the first place. Yes. So so that's kind of how I think about lucky and. and you, 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 when you look at the outcome, it feels like you're lucky, but it was kind of sequence of right decisions made on probability analysis. Mm. And I know your your background, even before going into VC, you were working a lot in the in the gaming industry, right? Yep. So how did you transition from gaming and, and to VC and then from VC to SEM Rush? So I think, and you know, I, ha I had a couple of jobs in tech before that, but I think gaming was really the first truly entrepreneurial role where we had to build something from scratch. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, I, I liked computer games from, from, you know, very, very beginning. As long as, as I remember myself, I loved computer games. Yes. My father bought some, some really cheap, really basic um, computer when I was five. And uh, all I wanted to do is to play games on this device. Mm. Uh, my father always wanted me to start, you know, programming, but I, I kind of first didn't want to do any of this. I just wanted to play games. <laughs> and I was fascinated by the, by, you know, by, by the whole idea that you can have entire world that you can be in, and this mm. all happens in a computer. Mm. Uh, and uh, even though those games in the 90s, they were really basic. I, I was fascinated by how realistic they were. Like mm. uh, when when uh, Doom 2 came out, I thought yes. this is a very realistic game. Right now yes. when I look at, and it's um, it's yeah. a mess, like yes. it's, it's not yeah. realistic so at all. Pick the pixels in, and all that, yes, of course. Yeah. Back uh, in the day, it felt like, yeah, this is almost like, like real life. So, um, so I was fascinated by by games, and my dream always was, you know, when I grow up, I will be building games. Mm. Um, and and you know, you always have like your favorite games, and you know, like yeah, if I was doing this, I would do this even better. So mm. I always felt like you know, one day I'll have enough money, and and I'll be building my own games, and they're going to be awesome. And um, that's that's you know, me and why me and my friends decided to go into gaming, and uh, we had two different businesses. The first one was. Uh, kind of game development studio. And the mm. second was publishing, where we uh, took other people's games and um, and published them in the you know in the Eastern Europe. Mm. Mm. And uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it was really interesting business, really good experience. Mm. Uh, the problem is, it was nothing like what I dreamed about when I was a kid. So, mm. you know. And, and I felt this this happens almost to everyone in the gaming industry. They enter gaming industry because of their kind of childhood experience yes. and uh, as a gamer. Yes. And then they realize it's actually very complicated software development business with a lot of nuances. And, and it's kind of hard to make money. And yeah. then 
it's even harder to finally get enough money to build this kind of game of your dreams. Yes. Uh, and, and even and after it, you build it, it's a whole other thing to just sell it to the world. Yeah, and then, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then even if you build it, it doesn't mean you will be commercially successful. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we scaled it to, to a very distant size. Mm. But at the end of the day, I felt like, um, you know, we, we never... We never had enough time to like shut down all all the development and build our own game. So we were doing mm. a lot of outsourcing mm. for you know big guys like um, like World of Tanks, Electronic mm. Arts. Mm. So all those big players. We never had time to stop kind of this line of business and build mm. our own IP. Mm. And then publishing was great, but then in publishing, like we had success with with one game. And then we needed to start licensing new games. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's not, at some points, um, it's, um, it's a complicated, complicated decision. Because, uh, yes. you know, you're betting a lot of money on, on the on, I, on I your feel, ability I feel, to choose I, right I, game. Yeah. I feel the gaming industry is very similar to kind of to the movie making industry, right? Yeah. That you can make a great movie. It's very complicated. Uh, it's a lot of risk. Chance of that losing money is very, very high. And then you got to sell the movie. Even if it is very, very successful, you're only as good as your, your last project, right? Then you got to think of the next game you're going to push, what, what, what it's going to look like. And that takes many, many years. And would the marketplace change? Would they lose interest? Nobody knows, right? It's, like, it's good watching an action movie. It's not so good being in an action movie. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, and you actually see very similar trends right now between um, gaming, at least AAA gaming and yes. uh, movies. Yes. Most of the success, commercial successes are franchises like yes, yes, yes. the yes. just continuation of previous yes. IP. And it's very, very hard to build entirely new IP and make it successful. And then yes. if you think about money required to build something like this, like true AAA games, yeah. they... They could be more expensive than than even blockbuster movies. Yes, uh, and um, and they they also make more money at the end of the day. Yes, but yes, yes, this yes. is kind of different league. You cannot go there. So yeah, yeah. So in you know independent studio without support of um, you know publishers who own IP can maybe build something you know with a budget of million dollars, couple million dollars. Mm. It's not, it's not going to be this sort of game of your dream AAA kind of game. And then, mm -hmm. and then what it means, even if you have this kind of couple million to build your IP, it's going to be full of compromises because you cannot build an expensive game. You, you, you need to build good looking game with interest in gameplay, also taking into account all the budget constraints. And that's mm -hmm. sort of very hard. Very few people, you know, end up being successful with this mm -hmm. task. So, and, and another one, another one was, like games that we liked were not necessarily games that were making money at that time. Like mm -hmm. games um, that would make money were like Supercell games or, or Machine Zone games. So mm -hmm. the, those kind of mid-core strategy, you know, online online multiplayer games. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't like, we, we liked like hardcore old school RPGs and, and th there was no money in this genre, so to speak at that Got point. It. Got it, got it. And do you see now the whole gaming industry is much more, example, you look at PlayStation, you look at Xbox, uh, now they have more backends. They have more, hey, let's create a game, but the money, it's really, uh, you, you buy more credits, you buy more coins, you buy more, like, that's where the money is. They, they want you to spend money on that. The game, whatever, 30, 40, 50 bucks you spend, it just to, to get you in the door, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And this, this, have been strategy that proved to be very successful with mm. um, free to play games. Yes. And I think like right now, AAA games just adopting the same strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, if you look at games that make more money, they have this sort of end game where, mm. yeah, the game itself initially is just, just a, you know, kind of food to something to put a foot, foot through the door. And then they get you, Kind of on, on a hook and and start monetizing properly. So and then, and then how did you go from gaming to VC and then to now SEM Rush? Yeah, so I mean, I started gaming. Uh, I started VC career even before gaming. Yes. Um. So so I've been partner in the seed stage firm. We did quite well, and then I wanted to kind of try myself as an entrepreneur. 
Mm. Uh, and then, as I said, at some point, this gaming business, we just felt, you know, it's, it's, um, I would say it's, it's a good, it was a good lifestyle business. Mm. We felt it's not necessarily something that we, we want to do to the, you know, re- for, for the rest of our lives. Got it. And, Got and, it. and uh, we, we, we closed some parts, we pivoted other parts. Mm. So, so one part of that business later became um, quite, quite successful software as a service company yes. that, that ultimately was sold um, to another big software as a service company. Mm. Um, but, you know, when we decided to go this way, I felt, you know, I can do something else and go back to uh, venture capital. So I joined a firm called Target Global. Yes. Um, where, where I was focused mostly on kind of late stage growth stage deals. Okay. Uh, which is kind of something that I really like doing because mm. I think with uh, with growth stage, you make decisions much more based on data versus kind of your, your gut yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I felt that um, kind of this is kind of better place to be comparing to seed stage. I think seed stage requires kind of kind of very, very strong. Um, no, I would say intuition, like just, mm. just understand, like, like subconscious understanding of how the world works. Mm. Uh, while it's more, I, it's more abstract. It's more the founder, the feeling, the connection, do they have the vision? It, it, it's more of a bet, right? It's, it's really, I think, I think looking back at, at how we were making decisions, how I know other BCs make decisions. Yeah. Some people would start looking at the at the team like they they yeah. maybe want to see very um experienced person in particular domain or mm, someone yes, who is yes. serial entrepreneur yeah and i guess it it kind of gives you a little bit more safety but statistically ser- yeah. serial entrepreneur is going to be marginally better and, yeah. and valuation of their company is going to be much higher so yeah. Yeah, you know, during during the seed round, so yeah. net net, you're not necessarily getting better chances. Mm. Um, but I think I think you know, some people can do this better than other people. Yes, yes. So yes, and and when when you when you look at how they make decisions, I think it's more about like you know they they have been th- thinking about something and ha- had some idea. Obviously, investors cannot do a lot of things mm-hmm. simultaneous, uh, yeah. sorry, themselves, yeah. but they can invest yeah. in many things simultaneously. And I think usually when, when I've seen people invest in seed companies, usually it would be something where investors already believe in this stuff. They just wanted to find right Someone. group yeah. of people to yeah. build. Yeah. This. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. And when you joined STM, Raj, uh, where the company was at, that was five years ago, correct? Yeah. 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 Where where was the company at and where since you joined the company, where is the company now? Yeah. So I think when, when I when I joined, we already had, I would say, very strong product. That's was primary reason why I joined. I've been using product myself for many years as a marketer and also as an investor mm. to find um, market trends, mm. uh, to do search engine marketing and uh, content marketing, and then also to mm. do due diligence in a, in a VC firm. So mm. uh, I knew product really well. Uh, and and um, then I met founders, really liked them, really mm. liked their vision. So I decided to join the company. I think in terms of the size, we were maybe a little bit over 100 people back then. Okay. And now we are over 950 people. Mm, so. Yes. So uh, I think growth, yeah, a lot of almost ten times a lot of growth. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and during that time when you when you joined the company, how did you uh, add value to the company? What are some of the things that you've helped to contribute that growth? So yeah, I think from from the beginning, I focused on couple couple of things. So so first one, we you know we were working on adding more experienced executives to the leadership team so for example my my job was to uh hire let's say chief revenue officer to establish sales operations yes um we started oh you know increasing our presence in the united states Mm. so significantly expanded Mm. our 
uh, office in um, in Philadelphia mm. and uh, opened two more offices in mm. Dallas and um, in Boston and then relocated our headquarters to Boston. But the, the main goal was to kind of start building the leadership team. How, how many people were on the leadership team when you joined? Well, I mean, I mean, we, we had, I think we, we had kind of more or less full, full, uh, full, full house, so to speak. Okay. But okay. I think some, some people who were uh, at that point, they were not necessarily uh, right people for the next step. Got it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we already had extremely strong chief product officer okay. who is still probably the best chief product officer I've ever met. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, we are, we are still, still lucky to have him. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, yeah, we had, we had founders who, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, were with the company from the very beginning, still with the company and, and, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, super, you know, super So you, you had the kind of full C-suite teams, but, uh, you felt that maybe some of them capabilities or the fit, yeah. they just not yeah, quite we ready to go to the next level. Yeah, we, yeah, and, and we we also didn't have we didn't have um, back in the day we didn't have a chief revenue officer, so yeah. that was important 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 position to hire. Yeah. And then, um, then yeah, if you look at who joined the company after that, um, chief uh, HR officer, uh, new CFO, mm. and um, and general counsel. So mm, so a lot it. of kind of this um, new new very experienced executives uh, who have been with companies that are probably even bigger than SEMrush and know how to do this. So I think that was very important part. And then sometimes also to attract really high quality talent, you have to raise money from notable investors. So yes. I was also raising money from investors. Um, you know, beyond that, back in the day, we were launching a lot of initiatives, but I would say my role was primarily building analytics muscles. So okay. Um, I focused on, mm -hmm. yeah, like frameworks on to make decisions. So, so I started building analytics team, mm. uh, as well, as well as working on packaging, monetization and, uh, pricing. So, so those were my kind of added value things from, from the beginning. Just for, just for my audience, for my listeners, for my viewers, uh, maybe give them a, a two minute uh, explainer video kind of ish. Uh, what exactly uh, is SEM and Watch? In case they don't know, and and what problems and what market you serve? Yeah, so Semrush is an online visibility management platform. Mm. So it's a software product that helps businesses, especially small mid sized businesses, to improve their online visibility in all key channels, from organic search and paid search to social media. Uh, digital PR, content marketing, and so on. So it's a, it's a platform of products uh, that people can use to get more traffic and ultimately, uh, you know, get more business online. Mm, awesome, awesome. And today, do you guys, uh, within the small, medium-sized business, do you have certain verticals you focus on? You kind of always, you kind of serve everybody. Yeah, we, we have customers across Pretty much everything you can imagine. I, I think I'll, I always think about this in a way that if you have website and you want to get more traffic, then you yes, probably yeah. would benefit from our product. Got it. And um, right now, I think almost every business needs website and needs traffic. <laughs> yes. Yes. And okay, so then let's go back. So besides executive team, that growth that really is, is exponential growth. Uh, what else? Uh, you could see that, that that you have implemented, the executive team has implemented, that has worked for, for the company to create that kind of growth. Because that's that's amazing in, in five years. Yeah, yet again, I think when, when I joined, I think the most important things were already right, which is which is mostly product. I think once, once you have a product where customers clearly see value exchange, mm -hmm. like, they're willing to pay money for getting your service. It's more about optimizing and polishing everything. So mm -hmm. for us, uh, I think establishing sales team was it was a big step forward. Yeah. Back in the day. Sales team. Okay. Yeah. And is, is um, sales team doing uh, just uh, outbound? 
So no, we 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 have inside sales team model. Okay. Where, okay. Yeah, where people first get to the website, then they they register, and then only after that we will start uh, working with them. Uh, and also, we, we usually reach out kind of after they show at least some some interest because Got you it. know we. Yeah, so it's a kind of classic inside sales model. Yeah, inside sales. Okay, and then uh, what's the pricing model for SEM Rush? So, we we have three core pl price plans. Okay. Um. So the first one is hundred twenty dollars per month. Second okay. one is okay. Two hundred forty. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is four hundred fifty. So. So that's um kind of main plans, and then. On top of main plans, we also have add-ons. So mm. parts of functionality that you can buy on top. And we also have extended limits. Like um, if you if you have a big team, you will have to buy more users. More users so it's more a combination time, yes. of, of um, kind of classic SaaS ladder. Three, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, yeah. Three, I call that three boxes, yes. Yeah, three, yeah. And I think about this as a three dimensions because yeah. if you if you expand in one dimension, you usually expand another dimension automatically. Mm. But but yeah, so main main dimension is just classic set of main subscriptions. Then we have add-ons, and then we have uh, extended usage limits like like users that people uh, can purchase. G, what about in terms of marketing? Did you guys scale up your ad budget, or did you do more organic to to attract more customers? So besides the team, besides the sales team, because that's inbound, that's inside sales. But what did you do to get that many more leads, right? That's a lot of people coming in, right? Yeah. So what we what we started doing is we definitely expanded our paid marketing. Okay. But at the same time, our approach that we follow both in the product and in our own marketing is that yes. You know, people spend today. People spend time everywhere, right? Yes. So, in the morning, you I don't know check your email, and then you check your Facebook, Twitter, whatever you <laughs> yes. do. Yeah. Sometime in the middle yes. of the day during lunch, you yes. maybe just, watch just a couple, videos. just a couple times a day, just a couple times just, a day. <laughs> yeah, it's not addictive at all, and you can stop yeah. at any point. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and uh, and then. The rest of the day, you search for stuff online, right? You're Googling things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're reading blogs. Mm. So, you, you know, my idea is that people spend time in all those different places. So if you want right. to be visible, yes. if you want people to remember you, you have to be in all those places. Yes. If you focus your marketing efforts on one channel, mm -hmm. then you have a shot at people twice a day. Mm, like mm, if, if you focus only on search, you say my user acquisition strategies, you know, whatever paid search, mm -hmm. then you have a shot two times a day when people search for stuff. You don't, you don't, you don't appear on their radar rest of the day. Mm. If you do everything, then you have a shot in the morning, you have a shot in the middle of the, in the middle of the day. Mm, mm. And, and you are there all the time yes. for them to see you. And, yes. and that's kind of approach that we do ourselves and uh, same approach that we teach our customers to do because, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's getting increasingly important to be visible considering that more and more businesses going online mm -hmm. and they produce more and more content. Mm -hmm. So your probability of getting noticed in each particular channel is not really increasing over time because mm -hmm. You have limited amount of customer attention mm -hmm. and you have more and more and more content created every day. So if you got to be, vis if you need to be visible, you got to be in, in all those places. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yet again, this, this is uh, an approach that worked uh, for us quite well. And this is something that we are uh, teaching our customers to do. And also this is where we focus our product development because we, we started, we started, 12 years ago as a product for search engine marketing. So yes. organic and paid search, but we yes. expanded our product very significantly because we saw the need mm -hmm. and we saw that you, you, you can be truly successful by focusing only on one thing this day. Yes. yes, that makes sense. So at the end of the day, it's focusing on, okay, how could I help the businesses get more leads, get more sales, get more customers. In the beginning, maybe it's one platform, 
more linear and now it's more omnipresent, right? It's like, hey, how can yeah. you be everywhere for your customers? So they find you, you're in front of them all the time. Now, in terms of differentiation, because of course, there are different softwares out there, the different competitors. Um, how do you see SCM Rush differentiate from all these other competitors out there? So the, the way we think about our product is, uh, first of all, it's, um, it's very important to have most complete solution. Mm. So in a way that you're not really competing with, um, with anyone as a platform, you may be competing with some people as point solutions, Got but it. if you have the most complete offering, then when people go shopping, they're like, okay, I have a choice. You know, I, I want to, I want to work in five channels. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I have a choice to buy five different products or something where I get everything in one place. Mm. And it's kind of almost no brainer that people um, kind of would prefer more convenient option. Mm. So I think that's the first part where you differentiate. And then we also have, uh, because we work in all those different channels, we have very, very unique combination of data assets um that, that we collect that, from like how, how does that help business owners so so yeah you can think about it this way uh, mm. let's say we have we have content marketing product and the, mm. the purpose of our content marketing product is to kind of tell people how they can write content so for example give them suggestions about what titles they need to use how long content should be what keywords they need to use in the content mm. you know what kind of readability target should be what mm. tone of voice they should be targeting and so on so mm. so that's the purpose of all content marketing process to give people suggestions mm. now if we were social media tool we would give us th those suggestions based on social media data that we have Yes. If we were search engine optimization tool, we would be given those suggestions based on search engine search. data. That we yes. Have. yes. Or yes. if we were a digital PR tool, we would be given those suggestions based on uh, PR data mentions and, and what journalists are writing about. Mm. But because we have data from all those places, we can combine them and give people suggestions based on all of those things. So, so their content will have simultaneously kind of trendy headline that people would want to share and interact with on social media. And at the same time, they will have really good text optimized for search. So this content is going to rank in organic search. Mm. And uh, this, is, th this is something that can be achieved only by combining data from multiple different places. I like that. Again, I like this that. is just one example. That makes sense. Because then, because you've been in business for so long, all these years of data, there is a huge competitive advantage because basically you're saying, hey, we know what works, right? Yeah. You, you can use some other tool, but we, we kind of have the playbook. We know this works, not just for our own companies, but for the millions and millions of customers that you have. So it's like the longer you're in business, the more users you have, the more powerful the software, right? Yeah, in, in a way, yeah, in a way. Definitely. Makes sense. Uh, what, what about Eugene? Let's say, let's say I, I'm I'm a I'm a business owner. I I'm running a business, right? I have a blog. I have a little bit of social media. Uh, if I was to become a client, because just if you can walk me through that, let's say I, I have a WordPress blog. I have a WordPress blog. I've got a YouTube channel. I've got an Instagram. Uh, I'm a, I have a local business. I signed up with SEM Rush. Uh, what what are some of the things I, I would need to shift? I would need to need to change to get better results to get more clients. Yeah, so I, I think it would really depends on what kind of business you have. But if it's okay. a local business with yes. WordPress website, uh, we definitely would start by just doing audit. Okay. So just check overall okay. technical health of the website. If, if it's properly built, how fast okay. is it? What's user Loading experience? Speed. Do you have any issues? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a lot of content that is already created, like maybe you have a blog, Yes. We'll also scan your blog and provide some low hanging fruits. Like you already okay, nice. did heavy lifting. You already created all this content. Now, okay. maybe you should just add a couple keywords here and there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should just add a couple paragraphs about this thing. Maybe you need to add video. So we'll just give you a couple of recommendations about what you, what you can improve with, the, with content that you already have. Yeah. Uh, we'll also um, set up uh, your your analytics products to understand how your traction changes over time. So you can monitor your progress Yes. because it's a local business. Mm -hmm. You probably would want to have 
uh, citation, citations properly built. So mm -hmm. your data is consistent across all directories. Mm. such as you know yelp facebook google or the reviews uh, trip advisor yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah whatever whatever is relevant for your business so mm. we have list and management product that mm. helps to do that and then also if you need to update your hours or upload you know new pictures maybe you have a new menu or you know, start providing new services or, or maybe you have some promotion so you can publish this in in uh, appropriate uh listing listing directories mm. And uh, we also will start monitoring how you rank on Google Maps for a particular set of keywords you're interested in. Mm. Yeah, that's that's probably kind of the, the first kind of um, phase. Mm -hmm. phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you'll have to start looking at what other people are doing. Like, yeah. because I think you cannot design your like, like go forward strategy in a vacuum. You need to understand you know, what works for other people. So we have a lot of products to, that, that will help you to do this kind of research across all key channels. Mm. And um, primarily they will show you, okay, who are your competitors, why they're successful, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. So you can look closer at things that are doing right and try, you know, to copy them in a way. Yes. Um, and that would mean usually you'll, you'll, have to create new content you'll mm. have to start running more um more content through social media accounts and build followership mm. uh and um yet again when we when, when we talk about content creation campaign execution we have a lot of those tools so we talked a little bit about our content creation tools that help you to build content and identify topics that will resonate with the audience uh we also have tools that allow to publish this content through your social media accounts. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, you know, to post everything manually there. Uh, and then once, once you run this campaign, we help to measure the results using, uh, you know, you know, using analytics products that you already probably set up on the first step. Yes. Um, but you can, you can now, because you're running more campaigns, you can see more granular results related to those new campaigns. So, so that that's kind of the the cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it lean cycle of marketing. In a way, yes. first you have to identify growth opportunities. Yes. Then you have to build content around those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Then you execute campaigns, distribute content through key channels. Mm -hmm. you know, social media, digital PR. If it's if it's relevant content for digital PR, like if it's a local business, sometimes you you're not going to do digital PR. But if it's a digital business. You probably want, want to try to distribute it through some journalists and um, and uh, also paid. I mean, you can never underestimate paid. So sometimes it really helps to um, start running the advertising campaigns to drive a little bit more attention to your product and your content. And then we help to measure results. So ultimately, once you review results, you can either double down on this What's strategy working? or go back to research stage and start researching new strategies. Eugene is interesting because uh, I'm curious with, I think a lot of SaaS companies now, uh, the ones who are thriving, depends on the niche, but there's, there's a, the education component. It's one thing to say, hey, here's an amazing software but most people would be like, well, how does this work? How do I use it? How does that work? Uh, when did you guys launch the Academy and how has that helped the company overall? Retaining customers, attracting new customers? Yeah. So yeah, for, for us, um, Academy is, is um, really a continuation of our vision mm. and uh, our mission to empower as many marketers as possible. and. Uh, you know, the thing is, people, you know, especially entrepreneurs, when you think about yeah. how they get into, into business, uh, they usually have an idea and they're passionate about something mm -hmm. and they just start building because this is kind of who we are. We just build yeah. stuff <laughs> and we never have time to learn, you know, how to sell this stuff, how to market this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of big gap that we wanted to fulfill because we saw in many cases we have really um really talented people who use our product but they're just not marketers and we need yeah. to make them marketers as fast as possible because mm. as i said right now especially if, if you rely on 
online presence yeah. in terms of your customer acquisition, you have to be market ready. Yes. Um, so, but that's that's why we started creating all those courses in the academy to teach people at least basics of the marketing, so they can properly use the tool and achieve results. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen a lot of great stuff, very positive feedback from people who sort of went from zero to one, like not knowing what they do to becoming real pros. Mm -hmm. um, one, of my, my, one of my favorite guys is, we have a customer which is dentist clinic in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And uh, their, their CEO who is, who is like dentist, Mm -hmm. uh, running their marketing and they, they went from like being not really well-known clinic to being one of the top clinics in their city, mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a very short period of time, all, all of that's, you know, from using our product, implementing right recommendations and also learning through our academy. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of, for me, like, you know, when, when, when artists see their their painting finished, for me that's almost like the same kind of feeling. When when you see people who couldn't do marketing mm -hmm. before, yes. Yes. then you know went through academy, started using product properly, achieved great results. That's kind of best thing that that kind of sort of make, makes my day, in a way. Mm. And I always believe that an, an educated, informed customer is a better customer because now we could give them the best tool, but if they are not educated or properly informed, that it's very difficult for them to get the most out of the tool that we are giving them, right? And by helping them becoming better marketer, for sure, then they use the tool more often. And it also makes them better customers. Like they, they retain more, they get more results, they're happy to give you referrals and reviews, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, it, it definitely helps um, to get better, better customers. Mm. I'm thinking about this, Customers in general become better customers when they're more successful and they yes. have more, you know, more results using the, your products. So it's mm. it's our job to help them achieve better results. Sometimes you have to do this through education, mm. um, but ultimately, yes, by having more success, they also become better customers. Yeah. Do you find that also, like as we've talked about the good things, uh, are there during the, the five years you had with the company, are there moments where you, you, it's like, oh, this is a big challenge that we, we're seeing, or this is like when we grow from this size to this size, like what are some of those like, you know, I call that a, a holy smoke moment, right? Like, oh my goodness, man, like we're growing, but this is a big problem. Like, and how did you overcome those problems? Yeah, I think, I think the, you know, th those moments happen all the time. I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, you know, when, when we talk to our product teams, I usually like to say that the, the day you come to me and say there are no problems to solve, I kind of don't really need you anymore, yeah, right? Yeah. Then we because, got a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's, that's the big problem. Until, yeah. you, until you see what else we can do and how we can improve the product, mm. that's... Um, that's a right problem to have in a way. Nice. Uh, but I think, you know, like, like any company that is going through, through growth and changes, I think it's, uh, you know, hard things are maintaining culture as you scale organization, yeah. especially when you have more and more people who join the company who, let's say, never had the same experience working with founders day to day. Yeah. That's, um, that's a big Kind of challenge for every organization that is going through kind of growing um phase mm. and then also like changing structure and adopting it to kind of new scale mm. also always um well then, I wouldn't what, say what, what, yeah, yeah but what, what do you guys do now with 950 people uh, i assume a lot of them working remote some may be in the office but like, how do you, like, it's one thing to have a team of a hundred, it's a whole other thing to have a team of almost a thousand. Like, how do you have everybody engaged? Like, what are, what are some of the things that you guys do? Maybe tools, maybe uh, just even rituals, right? Habits uh, to have the, pe the, the team, the people engaged. So, yeah, we, we from, from the very beginning, we had um, kind of culture where we, encourage people to take a lot of 
responsibility and ownership. And in return, uh, we would give them a lot of freedom to make their kind of own choices. Autonomy. So yeah. in a way, we have a um, very decentralized organization okay. where, where people can work autonomously. So for us, switching from in-office environment yeah. to, to remote, yeah. remote, remote re environment was not that hard. Okay. Um, I would say the biggest challenge in switching is um, emotional. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people just like to be with other people in the yeah. in the same room. Again, maybe maybe not necessarily every day, mm -hmm. but I think you start appreciating your colleagues only when you yeah, have to spend true. that that much time without opportunity to talk to them and meet them in person. Yeah. So so that was I think more of a challenge, but. Also, I think in many offices, uh, we uh, we already can allow people to return if they want. We still provide an option to work remotely if it works better for them. Yeah. But I think it's um, it's already you know much better. And as I said, we we were set up in the right way where people can work autonomously, um, and and they don't the require like ever like like daily supervision. In a way. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And and do you any do you have uh, uh, different people working in different time zones? Obviously, right? How yeah. do you guys have meetings? So, yeah, that's actually one you know very interesting part. So we we have um, we we still have a lot of overlap in terms of time zones between offices. Okay. So okay. so our we we have a lot of people in Europe. Okay. And then we have uh, most of other people in okay. kind of New York time zone. Okay. Yeah. So so we, we have people in Boston, Philadelphia. So the only the only office that is kind of far from that kind of main main time zones mm. is Dallas, but it's also yes. not that far. Okay. Um, but also it allows us to cover uh, West Coast in terms of our sales activities. So Dallas is kind of enough to to kind of cover almost full day for California. Got it. Got um, it. But outside of this, we, we have at least four or five hours of overlap. So it's, it's okay. enough for people to do meetings. But we, for example, when we were thinking what, what should be our main headquarters in the United States, we mm. thought about like you know, California or Austin, mm. Texas. We, we felt that would be too far from European time zone. We would not have enough overlap. Uh, um, okay, makes sense. So that's why Boston, for example, we, we consider it only, only cities uh, yeah. on the East Coast. You can still make it work. Yeah, it makes sense. You can still make it work. And also we, we tell people in, the, in, in Europe to come start working a little bit later. So maybe mm -hmm. they start at noon. And then in the United States, we start working a little bit earlier. earlier. So I start work. Yeah. Okay. So I start working at like 7, 8 a.m. Yeah. And uh, th this, way, this way, I have a lot of overlap. Nice, nice, nice. And then you could, do you have, uh, I assume now so many different divisions, then the division head is having meetings with different different time zones. Now the, the time is okay. So that doesn't affect too many things. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That, that's a good idea. It's interesting because we just started incorporating within my organization, uh, some of the team members actually have a Friday, like late afternoon, they, they would like play some games online together. Uh, just it helps with the bonding, right? You know, just little things like yeah, that to yeah, yeah. to make sure that hey, you know, it's not just work, 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 work all the time, but that you, we can get to know each other a bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We we had we had had a lot of uh, activities of this kind when yes. everyone was in the office, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm kind of looking forward towards you know continuing this tradition once uh, coronavirus is over. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we we do a lot of. Uh, Kind of in person, in person activities where where people can learn more about their colleagues. It's it's really important to you know work with people mm. in a way that you know who they are, what's important for them. Yes. Um, it uh, other, otherwise, if you you know if you work only through Zoom and, and email and Slack, at some point yeah. people yeah. stop yeah. being people and they become just you know uh, some kind tech. Of, Next kind of machines, kind of like we, we become very robotic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And right. it's it's very important for for teams to have empathy to each other, um, and um, that as I said, that, that's why I I think when when this kind of pandemic is over, 
will probably be back to office, not necessarily like 100% of the time, because mm. I think it's, you know, once people had a taste, hybrid, like, right? yeah, but probably some hybrid environment. Uh, but, you know, we, we still have a lot of time to figure out how exactly it's going to work. And, and we, we see that many companies is, you know, still in the process, process of understanding, but. And then and going forward uh, now, five years, huge amount of growth. Uh, what do you see in the next five years? Like where the company is going, uh, also your role, your role in it? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my role, um, you know, I, I think more or less the same. I recently started uh, working more on corporate development. Yeah. Uh, so last year we acquired a company called Prowly to expand our product in digital PR space. Mm. And um, I, I think, you know, I, I'll probably keep keep doing more or less the same. It's um, it's actually funny that, you know, as as company gets bigger, you actually, us, senior leadership usually takes more narrow roles, which is counterintuitive. Like mm. the idea is usually company gets bigger, so I have to worry about more stuff. Mm. Uh, in reality, what I see is that as company gets bigger, you can have people who are like really, really good in specific areas. So you mm, don't have like to spend time focused. there mm -hmm. and you can be more focused on things you're good at. And mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still in the process of like wearing less hats. Uh, <laughs> yes. At the beginning, I have had too many. Yes. Uh, how big, yeah, how big is the executive team now? How many people are on, on executive team? Yeah, so so we we have the full the full team. So twelve, um, chief revenue officer, chief product officer, CFO, uh, chief HR officer, yeah. chief strategy officer, which is yeah. me. Yeah. Um, general counsel, and uh, two founders who are uh, CEO and CEO. Okay, makes sense. That makes sense. Awesome. Uh, for my viewers and listeners who uh, want to find out more about SEM Rush. Uh, what's the best way for them to do that and for them to just kind of get the ball rolling and, and get started if they want more visibility online? Yeah, absolutely. So just go at samraj.com. Uh, I think website is super easy to navigate. You get into the product very fast. If you want to learn more about marketing, we have a great blog. Um, and uh, we also produce tons of uh, educational content for our academy. And also we have YouTube channel with a lot of and in this educational content. So um, I, I think once you get to samrush.com, it'll be very easy to navigate from that. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Gene. Thank you for being on the show and thank you for being so gener generous, sharing your ideas and, and love the, the gaming metaphor analogy and some of the things that you've learned. It's, it's very fascinating, but thank you for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.